All right, so I'm back. I'm going to stream an assembly about student debt. Is this the student debt assembly? Yeah, it sure is. Okay. Sweet. Smart. <laughs> Flyers, too. Need them. Next time, maybe. I'm Waylon. I'm yeah. I'm happy that the weather is warm, but not like sweltering. I'm Sue, and I'm happy to be here. This is the first time I've been to the summer disobedience school, and it's really a great day. And uh, glad to be here. I'm Pam, and um, I'm also really glad to be here, and especially because I finished like all of the papers. Things like that, and presentation, that I had to do yesterday. So I feel like that freeness of summer. I couldn't come last weekend because I had to go to a wedding, and um, so here I am. Hi, I'm Christopher. I'm Christopher, and uh, with uh, Wall Street and um, education. How was this? Um, I feel great. I, I love marching. It's like a sport, so it's a form. I love the whole, uh, I just, I feel great. I, I, that, that finale over there with the police, I felt was just like so amazing, solidarity there. It just really, it was like, it, it was like tactics in action and very effectively done. And I felt great. I'm John, I'm happy to be here on this day because I'm trying very hard here. set up right there, we will definitely want to be moving away if that happens. Uh, as nice as the music is, we should be prepared to move away. Thank you.
I, I'm Dan. I've been involved with Rocky by some past season, but first year. Um, but uh, it's that it, it, you know, I feel like when I went to college 10, 10, 12 years ago, my eyes were sort of closed about it. I just accepted that debt was part of it. And now I'm just like, wait, why do you call, am I paying this much money for education? To be taught things? And like, I was so like dumb to it in college. I was all about drinking and chasing women. And now I'm just, it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's like one of the biggest issues. You know, so. Great. So, yeah, should we get a temp? Do we want to stay here for the moment, or should we move now before the music starts? Let me ask you for a Yeah, why don't, you, why don't we check? Now? So this is kind of an impromptu meeting, right? Uh, but I think that uh, Pam is going to give us some information as to the second page is coming tomorrow. I mean, we kind of have a, a free one discussion. If we need to have kind of yeah, back and some purpose, we'll do that. But let's keep it fairly open. So we'll see how That's we go. awesome. They're going to wait until all the uh, breakout groups are all the teachers are yeah, right. So, so um, yeah, we kind of just, uh, I've been a part of the, well, back in the early days of Occupy Wall Street as well, there was a working group that we called I guess it still um, exists, um, but we broke up into different groups, and I'm fortunately a part of two projects. One has been the Occupy Student Debt Campaign, and the other one has been Occupy University. So this kind of moment coalesced, and, and here we are. Um, so I'm sure I, I know some of you guys, and uh, I'm sure you know quite a bit about the uh, one trillion dollar student debt crisis. We're probably ready. Um, just so that we're all on the same page, I'll just toss out a couple of uh, facts. Um, right now, 58 percent of Americans who are over 25 who are college degree also have uh, student debt. Um, the class of so the class of 2005.
division loans, you cannot declare them um, unpayable even in bankruptcy. Um, the other thing that, they, that they've done is they have um, they created a guarantee for for debt. So, in other words, if you borrow a hundred thousand dollars, then ninety-eight percent of that is guaranteed by the government. So, if you default on it, then it just goes to the taxpayer in essence. So, those are the two ways that they facilitate the banks. And the banks make tons of money off these products. They actually um, uh, securitize them just like uh, mortgages are securitized, um, and they sell them in packages. And student loans are, you know, sold to your grandmother as like a super secure, you know, these packages because they um, are guaranteed by the government. Um, they also, the government recently changed their, their ways and became the direct lender um, in most of the lending. But um, the banks still make tons of money on fees and on servicing these loans. And in fact, if you do default, the banks make even more money because there's no way out of default. So at some point, they rely on you to realize that you have to get back into the American economic system somehow and by then you're paying like you know exponential amounts of money sometimes it can triple your loans in a really in a fairly short period of time um then you've got schools and kind of what uh, i think i didn't mention the government also we we uh, stopped funding education so a lot of the money that we used to uh, put towards education we were funding at the state level has diminished significantly in most but not all states um, then the third entity is really the schools. The schools have raised tuition. It's a 900% tuition increase since the 70s. Um, in, the, in any other uh, area of our economic marketplace, uh, things have been based much more on the kind of economy that we're in. But even in this recession, tuition is still increasing. And they've also uh, become reliant on those increases because their business model has changed to not what sort of an education model, but much more of a real estate based model. So you see across the country that schools are um, expanding their real estate they're in, this, in a cycle of endless expansion pretty much to accommodate more and more students because actually we have gone up to 30%, which is kind of surprising, but it's really the correct number, about 30% of this country is now getting a college degree, um, which is an increase of about three or four percent um, over the last I mean, the wheels, you see the videos, And then the, the fourth sort of group or entity that's involved in this whole thing is us, right? It's the, it's the people, it's the student debtors, the borrowers, um, all of us. And so, um, so that's another group. And what we've basically found is that, of course, no way, here you serious? understand, um, the middle class wages have stagnated, so families can no longer save money where they used to be able to save. My parents were able, on middle class incomes, to save money for all of my college tuition over time, but now families are completely unable to do that, even families with very high income, um, because the cost has risen incredibly. So, it seems to, to me and the people who work with Occupy Student Debt Campaign that given the nature, the interrelatedness of all these entities, that there's really only one uh, place that this can change. And one of the things that we've seen a lot is we've seen a lot of um, bills in Congress, like the bankruptcy bill, the student loan forgiveness bill, um, all dealing with like one piece of this problem in some way, but we haven't seen any of them actually pass. The forgiveness bill right now um, is calling for 10% uh, of income paid for 10 years, and then up to $45,000 can be forgiven at that point. Okay, uh, and that's only with government uh, direct loans. If you're able to consolidate into that, um, but if you look online, you can see it only has a 1% chance of passing. There's virtually no no chance that our government is really going to be able 
to solve this problem, given our current politics, where we have 94% of our elected officials um, having had the most campaign funds um, to spend on advertising, etc. So we are kind of tied to the system. So it seems apparent to, to us that what we really need to have is a political movement, and that that political movement should be based on uh, debt refusal, something that we sang about <laughs> today, actually. And that uh, we would collect a million people, and um, a million people would collectively uh, basically end our complicity with uh, the un kind of unjust uh, system. And one of the questions that has been, and this is my last thing, and then we can talk, but one of the questions that's always asked at this point is, well, has anything like this ever happened in American history before? And I think it's a really interesting question for Occupy Wall Street, because for months and months I was thinking, I can't think of any real cases of, um, of debt refusal in America, although it happens all the time in other countries. And then I, I somehow a moment hit me, and I remembered from my childhood, growing up in New York City, that there was a massive, what was called a rent strike, but it was in Cork City in the Bronx, which is where I grew up, and it was a refusal to pay mortgage uh, maintenance payments, not mortgage payments, but maintenance payments, because the, the, um, the owner of Cork City, um, had gotten into enormous debt, and the tenants, the cooperators, the owners of these apartments didn't think it was fair that they had to pay for it. The state had sponsored the, this program to enable middle class people to have uh, nice places to live, basically, at a time in the city that was kind of a uh, kind of urban decay. And um, this was sort of like a utopian housing, you know, community uh, concept of housing. And, uh, for over a year, 15,000 people actually refused to pay their maintenance and withheld $27 million from, from the government, and not from the government, from the owners, from the banks, from the people this money was going to, and under risk of being evicted. And in the end, they were able to reclaim um, control over the co-op form. So the reason I bring this up right now is that I think that one of the things that I found when I was researching this is that there's not a single uh, picture of this that I can find through Google. There were articles, but there were no uh, like images. I did a presentation for a visual uh, culture conference that I was looking for culture. I couldn't find it. And so I guess what I thought we might be able to kind of talk about is two ideas. One, that seems that is like a critical juncture of inequality and how to address that, how we think we might be able to partner with others who are at critical junctures, perhaps, as well. Um, and then two, like, how do we get past the problem of representation, of showing people what student debt uh, either looks like or feels like or is like or some powerful imagery that we can associate somehow uh, with students. Yeah. So in terms of how the conversation happened, you can talk about anything you want, but that's kind of what I wanted to share. I thought that um, we might, if, there's, if we need a stack, we can have a stack, but as opposed to it being like, you know, you mean kind of like you address me or whatever, um, if whoever speaks can, you know, sort of call on whoever is next, whoever might speak next, uh, so it can kind of go around in more of a, in more of a circle.
just want to say that, you know, you look up in Quebec and you see hundreds of thousands of students on the street and you just don't see that here. And granted, they have more of a history of, of you know, more free education up there, so probably, you know, taking taking even the slightest hit to become to tuition is going to be noticeable and they might react in a different way, but I think we need to find ways to see what they're doing and why is that not working here? What is it just this culture of, of U.S. students that they seemingly don't care or they've just grown complacent and accepted their fate? I, I honestly, I, I think I have a, a, a partial answer to that. And part of it comes from, does everybody know a collective action problem is? It's like a political science kind of idea. It's basically, a, the, the collective action problem is um, when, like, people will, um, will collectively act for a common goal uh, only under certain circumstances. For example, when the cost is too high to the individual person, or if the, um, the, the, first, the individuals in the group perceive that, oh, well, the other people are just going to do it, so why should I put effort into it? Um, I think one factor that represents the cost side of it is, oh, that we might not be considering is the, the just the very fact that people who are in, who have lots of student debt, um, don't necessarily have the means to come out and to participate, or they don't, or they're burdened with other things that they have to deal with, like job situation, uh, bills, just schools in general. So, uh, I think that what, maybe what we need to do is focus our attention to reducing that cost, so to speak, for the individuals who are affected. So, if we go to college campuses, maybe, and try to get more help, or we do things with, uh, I, I don't know how you reduce the cost, so, if we have any ideas on that front. I think that um, you know, a couple of a couple of the uh, problems that we're running into. I, I think some of the some of the genesis of the problems that we're running into, or some of the hardest problems getting people out. I mean, it's, it's that we need to get the we need to get undergraduates out of it, and it's tough because they're not debtors yet. You know, that's the issue. So I think what we're looking at, part of what we're looking at, not the high school debt campaign, is educating um, undergraduates, and we're really now starting to put our brains together about strategizing for the fall and they come back to school. So we, we are trying to make a push towards reaching undergraduates on campuses and stuff. Um, and tomorrow is going to be a really opportune uh, assembly to, uh, at noon in Washington Square Park. No, the, the assembly, uh, the uh, education and debt assembly at noon tomorrow, um, sponsored by Occupy Theory, Free University, and Occupy Student Debt Campaign, starts at noon. Uh, tomorrow, and that'll be a great place to come and contribute some ideas and, and receive some ideas. Uh, but we are really starting to think about reaching out and um, and affecting some graduates. Uh, uh, what I've noticed yeah, is there's been a lot of action by grad students and graduates and even faculty of universities are very interested in that. But undergraduates are the largest number of and then there's also the issue of shame around debt. Um, that's a big thing, you know, there's a shame issue around debt, and uh, I'll just throw that out there. About that. I, I, want, I disagree with what you said about undergrads. They very well know about debt, and they know that anything, any financial aid that they have is not in the form of grants or scholarships is going to be a debt that they're going to carry. I've lost two students, two freshmen from last year. I'm not going to have this year because they can't afford Long Island University. And I think part of the problem is the commitment is not strong enough. If we admit students, we should also agree we're going to do whatever we can to keep these students if they're performing academically. And our academic, our, our, our financial people should be beating the bushes for financial aid for students that we've accepted. And I don't see that happening for each of them. And so I think students need to put pressure on their financial aid. Thank you.
at this point we've been talking a lot about how we are. At this point we're coming back. We probably should have shown we probably want to start hearing about solutions. Even if we're not going to come around soon, just ideas of how things can be fixed. Not saying this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Yes, we know it's wrong. How do we fix it? Yes, we fix it. Up. Also, um, there have been a few marches between 200 and people. And that was excellent. Um, it also depends on where we're walking by when we march. At the same time, I'm thinking, what if we come to people who aren't going to come out every day like occupiers when we march? Occupiers are insane now. Most people are not, most people like, I marched yesterday, I want to relax and chill out about the computer. That's not, that's not always so bad. Occupiers are crazy. I love it. <laughs> um, but also, it's getting towards the summer. They might be having exams, they might want to study for that. Once the exams are over, if those are who's bringing you up, we might see a lot more people coming out. But yeah, it's just possible. I just want to um, say one thing that I think that we were um, Occupy Student Debt Campaign has, um, we have sort of proposed at least principles that solutions could be based on, a real solution. Um, I think one part of the problem is the actual amount of uh, debt that people have. The reality that they just can't pay it, especially with the people can pay it before the session. Now we have, you know, both depression where uh, people really can't pay it. So that's part of it. But then the second part is like, what do we do about it? I mean, how do we really fix the system that people can take back? So we have four interconnected principles, not necessarily meant to be separated. And one is that um, there should be a write-off of the current student debt. Two, that public education should be uh, free. Public education should be free. If, if, if there are student loans, then they should be at zero percent interest. No one should be profiting from uh, from the student loans. And then private institutions receive tons of public money inclusive of student loans, and they need to actually tell us where they spend the money. Uh, because right now they've been able to keep their books closed, which is really disabling to us um, because we can't really uh, say factually. We can say we're banking, where we see that they're spending it, but basically we can't really make broader uh, claims about where the money has gone without actually having physical, you know, real evidence of it. So, so that's what we propose. We propose that the million people refuse debt collectively for these specific principles um, being discussed and uh, being put into practice in some in some way. It's not that there weren't principles when we came up with the idea. It would be talked about and digested in multiple forms throughout the country. But that's what we're, we're putting forward. And uh, that's one of Hi there, sorry, I, I didn't announce myself before. My name's Medard. I'm actually I'm a lawyer here in the city. I'm very interested to hear what you guys are saying about this. Coming from a professional program, scholastic debt is a major problem. Like most most lawyers and doctors that graduate with you know over a hundred thousand dollars at least in debt and struggle through it for a few years and it's tough, right? But um, one thing that is really sort of making waves these days, at least in the legal education community, and it seems like it's a small change, but it's a meaningful change, and it's something that you can you can think about as a, as a feasible sort of thing to push for in the, in the near term without a larger structural change in education. It's just disclosure. It's greater disclosure from the schools regarding regarding employment statistics and regarding you know, I, you know salary statistics post, and so that so that students rather than going into a lot of debt and then finding themselves in a very in a tough situation, particularly where they may not be the political will to make that sort of fundamental structural change to to repayment of debt. Uh, uh, you, you just give them the information up front, and most people will be able to better assess the value of a particular degree against the you know the long term earning potential. So in law schools, there's been a lot of the, especially the private law schools have been accused anyway of being uh, of being sort of fudging the numbers in serious ways. And so I think that's probably happening in other in other faculties as well. And so they, you know just pushing the schools, pushing for better disclosure, and you know it's something that's a it's a small step. For, yeah. Yeah, um, I was just going to say that um, not everyone who supports um, 
changes and, uh, to um, student debt has to be out on the street marching. There are many other ways to do this, to support, um, especially with social media now. Um, there are tons of uh, blogs out there. Um, we just issued a statement um, all about uh, what the Occupy Student Debt Campaign is and how we fit into all of the um, dialogue taking place now, some of the current um, laws being proposed. And uh, if you go on and Google that, um, you can come up with people who are blogging All Education Matters, Descent Magazine, um, and, and just by talking about it to people that you know. You know, not everybody can be out in the street every day, but you can do something. And I think social media, uh, especially, you know, we're here in New York, uh, where Occupy started. But this is something that affects people throughout the country, throughout the world, in Canada. And we have that tool. And I think that we really need to use that to our fullest advantage. And um, just to keep the dialogue going so that people are aware and that there are things that they can do. I think as a community organizer, we were trained to, when you enter into negotiation, you ask for much more than you expect to and I think we should be taking a similar approach with regards to student debt, both existing debt and future debt, and, and demand that debt is forgiven. Um, set it up, like you were saying, uh, if you pay so much in at, after 10 years, then it can be forgiven. Um, and then what we should do is say to the government, this is the United States of America, and there was a time when we claimed to have the best education for our people. And we want to go back to those days, and we want you to pay for it. And every student that wants to go to school should be able to go to school and not have to worry about where the money is coming from. It's coming from the government. And if we say, okay, after you graduate, you've got to do two years of some kind of civil service, Peace Corps stuff or something, as a way to pay it back, that's cool. We'll do that. But we have to ask for the most extreme that we would hope to get. And, and I agree, this is New York, but I think as New York goes, so will go the rest of the country. And if we start something, it will grow and be picked up elsewhere. It's embarrassing that, like I said, people in students in Canada don't have to pay for their education. And here we are. Um, I agree with this gentleman right here. I don't have a problem with student debt. I'm a union worker and so is my little brother Danny right here. And we're lucky enough to have great jobs. Our, our job um, provides us with a good pay training and also pays for our education. So um, this is possible, number one. This is possible for everybody because it's happening right now. Um, as the gentleman was saying, as far as the government paying for um, everybody's education, it totally makes sense and it's cheaper. It's going to cost less because just like our uh, labor union uses the collective bargaining power of thousands of members in order to negotiate for cheaper health care. I don't pay for health care, okay? My labor union makes contractors to lay it out for us. But there's so many members at the bargaining table we're able to get a cheaper rate on everything. It's the same thing as socialized health care, and it should be the same thing for education. That's all I got to say. But I'm ready to help you guys if you need it. Just because I got a free education doesn't mean my son will have it.
I think that if we want to get people involved with marches and, and all of these different activities, I, I think we really need to make put the emphasis on um, reducing the cost. But I, I would like to have a serious conversation with them about that. When I was in school, there was a saying that was going around about the fact that we look forward to the day when the Air Force has to hold a big sale to buy airplanes, you know, as opposed to school teachers having to have a big sale to pay for the stuff that they need in the classroom. I don't know how much payment paying for every student's tuition in the United States would cost. I've got a feeling that the amount of money that we pissed away in Iraq and are pissing away in Afghanistan comes pretty close, and yet all of a sudden we came up with that money. And those who have gone to war, when they come home, if the GI Bill is still in effect, they can go to school. So why, why do we have to reward people for going to war with free education? Why can't we reward people with free education for going to peace and making this a better world when they get out? <laughs> well, what I was talking more about um, was, was, for example, union organizations are classically um, in, in downturns when the power, when the bargaining power was not as great, have provided support for their members uh, when, you know, either when they're out of work or when they don't have enough work or resources. I'm thinking of, I know Occupy does not have a lot of resources like that, but I was, I'm wondering if there is a creative way of coming up with a support system for students who are, who are going through uh, this um, to, to support them and thus make them more interested, more likely to get involved in, in various ways. So I'm wondering if there are ways, that's what I'm talking about in terms of reducing the cost of not participating, yeah. is supporting them in some way. And I don't know what, uh, how that would, um, what the incarnation of that would be, but I, I think it would be a good thing we could do. I mean, I definitely agree with you on the idea of putting it to the cost. Uh -huh. um, I think in terms of forms of mutual aid, um, the way that we have initially looked at it through our campaign, that as we, as we grew in the inventories, that we would take different steps. And certainly, we looked at more of that once people did, if people really, if, I mean, the government really left a million people involved in the disaster. Now, really, our government is really after millions of additional people, then we would need different forms of mutual aid. And that was how we had conceptualized reducing the cost of participation. But I think that your point is really well taken. And we have a person who works on the campaign with us, Karen Johansson, who's in Texas. And she has a website. And a lot of times people write to her that they're contemplating suicide. I mean, she's frequently getting really people are deeply in despair because they just really have no future beyond the debt. And also the types of indenture that the debt takes, be it just taking a job that you just really, really hate or feel morally against because you have this looming predator hanging over your head. Um, or just being forced into situations where, you know, this, the generation that's graduating now, um, they're lucky to get a job at Starbucks, basically. And they have, you know, with a college degree, that's, that's kind of depressing, you know? 
So one of the realities is that Starbucks is going to want to hire somebody who they know is just passing through. And so it's easy to say, get a job anywhere, but when you go and ask for a job and they see that you've got a degree, uh, they say, you're going to leave as soon as you get a better offer. So why should I train you? People take it off of their resume. So one thing we could we could do if people want, right, yeah, is return to Tom's question, right, which is, so how do we visualize this? There's a lot of kind of questions that how can we mobilize this movement, how can we kind of find various actions with different things. So I thought maybe to get a bunch of voices of this question, we could everyone could pop up in that circle, if you want to do that, and maybe just say like one image that comes to mind in terms of what do we think of when we visualize youth's death. Um, Maybe a positive image if you want, trying to raise something up, really whatever you want in this visualization. Do you want to do that? Just trying to go around in a circle. You don't have to speak if you don't want, but just kind of just get an array of images that we have with people dead. And from that, maybe you can also think about some solutions or possible actions. So, or I can start it. Yeah, Yeah, so I am. Um, I have two images, I guess. One is like this kind of the change, right? So this ball and change, which we see a lot over these like degrees that are actually bills, right? And um, but the image I was thinking, I was trying to think, okay, so what's a more positive image, right? Um, and then the marches, the, the casserole marches, I feel like there's something about this idea of like people like um, having pots of pans, this this kind of solidarity. I think so. If there's a way of like changing that image, that would be great. And I'm sorry, just while people are thinking, one other. <laughs> I wish there was an image for this question of where the money goes. Right? So the question, so I, I feel like I've, I've seen lots of images of people suffering under debt, but I haven't seen lots of images because we're making that connection between people trying to further repay their loans versus where that money is going to. I wonder. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that like college loan debt can lead to credit card debt too. So I'm trying to think of an image with that. I mean, if you're if you're paying back a loan immediately out of college or soon after, then you're gonna you gotta live. So you're gonna break up credit card debt. So, but I'm trying to think of imagery around that. And then I don't know. Just that. Just I I still have a very difficult time understanding how the right to be smart and learn things costs the amount of money it does. Again, I don't know. I can't find it. I'm not good at that. Yeah. I
would be a great organization for Occupy to get more in touch with and network with. I'm thinking that we can network with similar organizations and say, hey, um, you know, could we um, sort of, uh, from, from like members of our organization, could we uh, sort of connect them with your organization for possible job opportunities, for example? I'm thinking of, you know, that might be one of the ways that you can reduce the cost for people to get involved is that I can actually maybe, you know, be involved in a really positive kind of job opportunity and I can, you know, get out of the dead end kind of thing and I can actually have a job maybe. Yeah. You know, maybe that's something to investigate. So that's what I think of. That's something that has to be. I think the where does the money go argument or question is a distraction. And it's something that we need not concern ourselves with. If, if you are somebody who's giving money, then maybe you want to know how it's being used. But for those of us who are receiving the money in one form or another, it doesn't matter how it's being used by the colleges and universities. I think it's a big picture thing. We want to train students to be the best that they can be when they get out into the world so that they can make the society the best it can be. And if we don't do that, we're going to spend more money trying to patch stuff up when we could have spent money to prevent stuff from falling apart. So I think the time has come when we have to combat that we have leaders that are prepared and they need not worry about how they're going to pay for their education while they're getting it, and when they get out, they're going to have a way to put it together, to use what they've learned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, my image of student debt, I've been long out of student debt, but I had a lot of it, and I suffered through it, and I had some help paying it off, and it was insane. I mean, my image of student debt is huge. Um, shopping, uh, brown paper shopping bags full of unopened uh, envelopes, and like sleep, sleepless nights, you know, um, just insanity, and also choices that I had to make that I would not have made if I had the freedom of not being in that kind of burden, that kind of slavery, that kind of fall and chain. Um, the positive thing I see is free universities, non-hierarchical learning, um, horizontal forms of education, um, you know, classes in the park, <laughs> stuff like that. It's just like a real utopia, man, of education. I think it's possible. And for that $67 billion, man, let's cut some of that military spending and get everyone educated, man. That's what I have to say. Numbers and 
it's just like this crazy thing. And then all the images I see are like, you know, stock market tickers. And it just is so hard to understand it in anything that we would call it human, human term. And I just would, I study uh, media studies and sociology. And so I can't help but wonder if we're working in a framework where it's really hard to to understand death, and if that hasn't been just completely to the advantage of the one percent, that it's just really hard to picture it, to understand it in that visual way in this very visual world that we're now living in. So I, I don't have a, a specific answer, but I think that where this led me is the idea of trying to find lost images more of a, a historical kind of an approach to trying to find these pictures, bring them into a new context so that we can start to see that. Because there's got to be some moment that people did do, you know, hit the street and say, we're not going to pay. And I mean, when the strike was happening in the books that I was talking about before. Um, so I'll let you know if I find any pictures of this. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I mean, I just, I agree um, with the aspect that you mentioned of people um, learning to depend more on each other rather than like, you know, going to Goldman Sachs for a job or um, hoping to get hired, whatever, by Bloomberg LLC. I mean, I mean it's, it's a lot easier to say than um, to do, especially when you have to go to the schooling you amass all this debt and basically you're forced to go to work for the bank that you fucking owe the money to. But um, I just, I don't know, it, it's a very hard mindset for people to get out of because that's basically how capitalism works. You know, you're in a hot for the rest of your life basically, you know, so you're 40, 45 years old, you got kids and you're still paying student debt. It's, it's nuts. It's depressing for me to even think about it. I mean, I know where the money is going, and that also depresses me, so I don't even want to, like, whatever. But I read these articles of these people that own these corporations, and they have a $3 billion yacht. $3 billion, excuse me? Okay, so they have, like, a, a jet in every color of the rainbow, but a person can go to fucking school. Like, that bothers me. But, um, you know, it's, a free education is totally possible. It's totally possible. People have fought long and hard for things we take advantage of, like the five hour, you know, five day working, simple things that they really had to fight for and die for. Let's be honest, like if you really want something in this country, you have to be willing to like die for it. If people, if you can like, if people can't wrap their minds around that, let's be honest, I don't think it's gonna happen. I mean, they don't care. People that are the controlling the lead, they control the banks, they speculate on Wall Street, they do not care about anything, that's the bottom line. I mean, I know you guys don't know this, but um, people really have to start thinking of, like, dare I say, like, radical terms, you know, like, how far are you willing to go over this? But, you know, they shut before, and, you know, we were able to get healthcare, government programs, be able to go to school, whatever, they put us through the National Resource Service. But that's because they were afraid of all the unemployed masses. They were, the government had to be scared. If they feel comfortable, oh, they're going to be like, I don't care about that. Take it by November 12th and get out of here. Until you make them afraid, they're not really going to. That's just my two cents. Well, let's keep it going, sorry. Okay, here's my image. Um, I see all the debtors together, housing debtors, healthcare debtors, student debtors, living in one of these foreclosed homes and collectively supporting each other. Um, really, every time I, I drive by one of these houses that are empty, I just ask myself, why? And I was reading an article uh, last night and he talked to him about um, have, have things like this happened in, in earlier in history. And, and I happened to be on the Occupy Homes website, and they were saying there was a point back, way back when, where they did take back 775,000 homes. I know we started to do that now, but we're nowhere near that number. So I say, let's just take it all back. 
That's my idea. Right on. So, aren't debt collectors calling sharks in the same way that cops are calling pigs sometimes? Sharks? Yeah. Yeah, so that's my image, is sharks. sharks. And then if you got uh, somebody with a ball and a chain, I mean, that's a compelling image right there. Watch somebody drag one of those things up 6th Avenue with people dressed as sharks behind them. <coughs> um, my idea was I was trying to think of a positive image because it's, it is much more difficult, especially when it comes to something like student debt, to think of uh, something that's positive. My thought was well, you know, we, we all got into debt for education because we wanted to do something with our lives. And I think that one of the things, unfortunately, that has happened is a lot of people have lost the conception of currency as a tool to be used for something else. It's not a means to itself. It's only useful because you want to use it to better your life in other ways. It's not, the point is to afford it, to use it. So I thought was an image of, you know, a little kid standing in front of a mirror, trying, you know, when you're little, you try on like an oversized, like firefighter helmet or an oversized doctor coat, because you're like, that's what I want to be when I grow up. That's what I want to do. Like, I'm so excited. Like. When you're a little kid, you're so excited to grow up. You're so excited to be someone. And when you get older, you know, you're taking that excitement and that vivacity and trying to apply it. And that's, you know, that's why we go to college and we spend the money. Also, you know, to educate education for its own sake. But, you know, it's because we're trying to be someone. And it's so unfortunate that because it's so complicated and bureaucratic and there's so much money and big corporate business involved, it's really difficult to not lose sight of originally it's because you were excited about living your life and becoming someone important, someone who you could be proud of being. So my idea of, as a positive image was a little kid trying on maybe like a bunch of things at once, like oversized fire department helmet, oversized doctor's coat, like, you know, like some gardening tools, like a bunch of an architect's map underneath his arm, standing in front of a mirror, standing on top of a giant pile of money. And just, you know, cause I, I really think, to, to me at least, I think that it's important, you know, it is it is difficult sometimes to explain why that is a big deal. And I know that a lot of, you know, the big businesses have been like, well, you know, you kids are irresponsible for taking on so much debt. But look, man, it's not about, it's again, like you're thinking of it, they're, they're thinking about as like the money is the important part. No, the reason why people were willing to take on this debt is because we've been told so many years, you know, you're 17, 18 years old going to college, you've been told over and over again, you want to follow your dreams, this is how you follow your dreams. Just deal with the fact that you'll be in debt. It'll be okay because you're following your dream. And then you go through college and you come to find out like, oh no, sorry, there's no there's no safety on that in place. Sorry, you're fucked. And so I think if we can bring it back to this idea of, look, why did we get into debt? It wasn't because we were being stupid or we were being irresponsible. It was because we had a goal and a dream and we should all, that's something positive that we can really focus on. So that's my idea. Uh, just in terms of visual, I think at the beginning of the discussion, there was there was some emphasis placed and a great explanation of how it's really the debt and the uh, and the schools and the debtor and the banks and the government is sort of an ecosystem that's sort of a self-sustaining ecosystem. And so, drawing the links between those various institutions and showing how the um, you know the, the increases in, in tuition rates that that you know, are, are far in, far in excess of, of inflation over time and whatnot, this feeds into a system which is in some ways self-sustaining. And so the question, yeah, so to, to demonstrate that with back scratching or, you know, that sort of thing, it's just showing how each, so it's, it's not just one piece of the puzzle, it's not just about your education, it's about how it fits into this larger picture. Okay, so I'll just read out the images really quickly, so we have a sense of this picture that we've made, or various pictures, right? One is an image of credit card debt, one is where does the money go, someone looking for money, one is an image of slavery, and one is of shopping bags full of unopened envelopes. One at alternately a free university. One is um, this problem with ha how abstract it is, right? That we can't draw an image, right? Because flying roads would not be able to. Um, so looking for a human image. Another image of people depending on each other, working together. Another image of all debtors of different things living together in a foreclosed home. Uh, one of shark, loan sharks chasing a ball and chain. One of a little kid trying on various costumes to be a uh, uh, Future, uh, standing on a pile of money, and then the other is of an ecosystem where we have uh, people, all the parts of the abstract, and those facts are related. Um, so, so typically, like these things go for about an hour, and if people want to continue on talking for a little bit, what are people? Um, well, do people have more than they want to say, or think that they need to in the conversation? That would be the best thing ever. Like, bring up or questions that you have an answer to, anything like that? I have the same method that was used for 
originally for Wall Street. Uh, we, we got people more aware of the circle they need to stuff. So uh, I think that would work well also with this industry. Because, you know, like we said, it is an ecosystem um, that is, you know, Yeah, I'm feeling about the same way. It's good to talk with other people about it, something that's a big problem for me right now. Uh, I'm feeling more enlightened because it's always good to hear other people's ideas, put them together with your own. I feel like I'm very connected with everybody. That's part of the reason I have to have.
feel hopeful as well. And um, just like, you know, at 51 years old, man, it took this long in my life to find a movement that I can sink my teeth into and occupy and really start to create a world that I've always been dreaming of. I'm re-energized. I find that when I'm out in the field and it's not going well, that if I come into the city, I leave ready to pick it up again. watching me, Waylon Lank, at Lank.tv. This has been week two of Occupy Wall Street's uh, Summer Disobedience School. And we just finished up a little assembly on student loan debt. Thanks for watching. We were trying to get together a list of workshops and classes, art classes, and we provide like, uh -huh. classes throughout the university.